Please be seated. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful to be able to remember the story of your great redeeming love, especially to think on his taking on flesh and coming to dwell among us. Lord, we're so thankful for him and what he achieved for us. Thank you for his birth. May this truly be a special time of year for us as we contemplate his humility, which would only grow and become all the more surprising when he would go to a cross and humble himself and be obedient to the point of death for us. Who are we? We do not deserve this. We deserve much worse. And yet you and your grace and mercy supply all we need in him. Help us now to set our eyes upon him, the one who has only ever been faithful to us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Jealousy often seems to us to be an awful word. In this world, it's a, it's a character trait that is not admired by anyone. Do you admire jealousy when you see it? But can you imagine jealousy actually being attractive, good, even holy? Did you know that one of God's names in Scripture is jealous? We're going to need our Bibles to explore this, so take your Bibles and let's open them to Exodus 34. If you do not have a Bible, some gentlemen are going to make their way up the aisles. You just raise your hand and they'll make sure you get a Bible. If you do not own a Bible, you can keep that one. It's yours. Exodus 34. This is the part in our service when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Um, it's called communion. We're going to commune or draw near to Jesus. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he broke bread and he gave it to his followers who trusted in him, his disciples. And then he gave them wine to drink. And he instituted the supper for those who believe him to be the Son of God, the only Savior. The bread is a symbol, it's a reminder of his body given in death at the cross and the wine is a symbol. It's a reminder of his blood shed at the cross. Jesus calls his disciples to worshipfully remember his death at the cross for forgiveness of sin when they eat this supper together. We eat a cracker and we drink juice and remember him. And when we do that, we proclaim his death until he comes again. And this communion with Christ is precious to believers in Jesus Christ because it allows us to worship Jesus Christ. It gives us the opportunity to reflect on our own personal pursuit of Jesus Christ and how that has been going, our faithfulness to him. It gives us an opportunity to confess our sin and to be cleansed of all unrighteousness. This is a precious time for believers in Jesus Christ. If this morning, though, by your own admission, Jesus Christ is not your Lord, you are not relying on him or his death to secure forgiveness of sin, then it's, it's more appropriate for you to listen carefully this morning than to participate in the Lord's table. But listen carefully to God's word today. Think on your need for a savior. What are you going to do about your sin? Simply this morning during this time, let the bread and the cup pass you by and, and evaluate your life before God instead and consider your need for the savior, Jesus Christ, to rescue you from the wrath of God. Now let's allow Exodus 34 to prepare our hearts for this worshipful remembrance of Jesus. Moses is with Israel in the wilderness. He's at Mount Sinai with them. 
Yahweh has delivered Israel from Egypt. They have promised to be faithful to Yahweh. And unfortunately, just two chapters back, they have tragically defected from him with the golden calf. And now they are at a crucial moment with Yahweh. And Moses pleaded with Yahweh to take Israel as his own possession. Look at verse 9 with me. Moses said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go along in our midst, even though the people are so obstinate, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your own possession. And Yahweh's response to that request was a covenant relationship with Israel. Look at verse 10. Then God said, Behold, I am going to make a covenant. See, this old covenant formed an exclusive relationship between Israel and Yahweh. He bound himself to them in loving kindness and in faithfulness with covenant love, covenant-keeping love. He would not be unfaithful to them ever. He would possess them alone in a unique way, unlike the other nations of the earth. Their response to him then was to love him with all of their heart, all of their soul, all of their mind, all of their strength. Everything about them gathered up in love, given back to Yahweh in faithfulness. They were not to sinfully cast their affections off towards another. They were to be faithful to him, to not enter into any other covenant relationship with another. Look at verse 12. Watch yourself that you make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land into which you are going, or it will become a snare in your midst. Drop down to verse 15. Otherwise, you might make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they would play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to their gods and someone might invite you to eat of his sacrifice. And you might take some of his daughters for your sons and his daughters might play the harlot with their gods and cause your sons also to play the harlot with their gods. Unfaithfulness. And it's in the middle of that exclusive covenant commitment of love and faithfulness that Yahweh reveals one of his glorious names. Look at verse 14. For you shall not worship any other God for Yahweh, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. First of all, if the holy and righteous God says his name is Jealous, and that he is a jealous God, then we must never think of his jealousy for Israel like the gutter jealousy that the world shows. This is a holy jealousy, a pure jealousy, an untarnished by sin jealousy, because Yahweh is holy and pure and untarnished by sin. He would never name himself with that which is sin. But it is also in the context of this exclusive covenant commitment that's marked by enduring loving kindness and faithfulness that jealousy is then sanctified, it's set on holy ground, and it is good in a relationship, something very unlike the world's jealousy. You can understand this. Think on a marriage relationship, the marriage covenant that a man makes exclusively with his wife. He commits to being faithful and exclusive in his love for her. He covenants to not cast his love or his affections on any other person, to live only for her and for her good, and she reciprocates that. So then what do you call the longing that rises up in that man's heart when another man woos his wife or entices his wife away? What do you call the aching in his heart when she casts her love or affection on another man? It's jealousy. Think about it this way. What would you say about a man who was indifferent to his wife's drifting? 
or wandering heart. Would you say that man truly loved his wife if he was not jealous? You wouldn't. You see, in an exclusive covenant commitment that's marked by covenant love and faithfulness, jealousy is set apart. It is sanctified. It is holy. It is good. It is right. That is when jealousy is actually the fruit of love, and it's the fruit of faithfulness. Covenant love and faithfulness. The absence of jealousy in that setting would only be proof of a loveless partner and relationship. So, of course, Yahweh's name is jealous. And of course, he is a jealous God concerning Israel, his wife in the Old Testament. His jealousy is the fruit of his covenant love and faithfulness to them. If Yahweh did not care about Israel's worship of the golden calf, if he did not care or if he was indifferent to their wandering love towards the idols of the pagan nations in the promised land, could anyone conclude that Yahweh actually loved Israel? No. In the middle of this old covenant love relationship with Israel, of course his name is Jealous. And that God, Yahweh, whose name is Jealous, took on human flesh in the New Testament. And in a newer covenant, Jesus, with great love at the cross and untarnished faithfulness to his bride, he exclusively committed himself to us. In limitless love in the New Covenant, Jesus shed his blood. He gave his body over to death to atone for our sins and to make us his unique possession, his bride. All of his affections are gathered up and poured out on us. He will never be unfaithful to you, believer. And this is what we remember believer, right? This is what we remember in the Lord's Supper, what love he has for us, that he showed for us in his death. He loved us faithfully to the uttermost, to the end at the cross, in order to make us his. Believer, let's also consider, though, that he is no less jealous of us when we wander from his commands than Yahweh was in the old covenant with Israel. Yahweh has not graduated from jealousy. When we deny Jesus after proclaiming our loyalty to him, does anything rise up in his heart? Is he not grieved? Is he not jealous? Did he not jealously pursue Peter on the beach that day after he was raised from the dead? And did he not question Peter's love for him? Not once, not twice, but three times. Jesus Christ longs for our faithfulness to him. Have you been? Have you been faithful, believer, this week? Confess where you know that you have cast your affections towards sin and return to him in repentance as you consider again this morning his covenant love for you. Will he not take you back? Of course he will. How many times has he already in love restored you to himself just like he did Peter? If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. Believer, when you have meditated on the holy and jealous love for Jesus, When you've meditated on his death in your place at the cross, take the bread and the cup on your own. And Smed will come and close our worship of Jesus.